Well, I want to thank you for uh, tuning in to our summer Bible teaching series for summer 2022 at NBC. We trust that these series will be an encouragement to you in your faith as you walk with Jesus and as you are better equipped to walk with others along their faith journey. We also want to remind you that at NBC, we are a year-round facility and we have a series of opportunities for you to engage in in keeping with our mission of growing resilient, biblically rooted families. So make sure you check out our website at muskokabible.com to get all the information. We'd love to see you up here this fall and winter. Okay, good morning. Please turn to the book of Psalms and uh, follow in a few minutes as I read Psalm 2. Uh, we'll see its uh, application uh, as we get on this morning. Uh, before I begin, though, let me, let me just say a little word about the books at the back, at least three of the books at the back. Uh, today I want to talk about a theologian, uh, what we <clears throat> technically call a pastor theologian. He was a pastor all of his life. Um, his name is Andrew Fuller. Uh, for some of you, maybe the name is uh, quite unfamiliar. Um, among the Baptists, he probably is the most important Baptist theologian of the 18th, the late 18th, all through the 19th centuries. Um, in some ways, uh, he might have been the most important Baptist theologian Baptists have ever had. And uh, we're going to focus on one small area of his theological thought. At the back, there are uh, a couple of books on Fuller. There is this one called The Armies of the Lamb. There will be a quote that I'll have uh, this morning uh, that uh, has that little phrase in it. And it speaks of his missionary passion. Um, William Carey, whose name is very familiar to Baptists, uh, evangelicals at large, who becomes in the course of the 19th century kind of the icon, if I can use that phrase, of uh, English-speaking missions. Um, he goes to India in 1792. He stays there till his death in 1834. Uh, William Carey uh, would never have gone to India if it had not been for Andrew Fuller, uh, both in terms of Fuller's uh, playing a key role in supporting him financially. Uh, Fuller becomes the secretary of the Baptist Missionary Society that sends uh, Carey to India, but also theologically. Um, it is Fuller who breaks the chains of hyper-Calvinism that dominated far too many Baptist churches in the uh, 18th century, which we're going to talk about. This book is a selection of about 30 to 35 of uh, Fuller's writings. Very small selections. Uh, they, you can read them in about five minutes. And it's designed for somebody who, you don't have all the time in the world to read Fuller, but you'd like to read a little bit about him and kind of gives you insight into a variety of, of um, his, uh, his thinking. Uh, reading Andrew Fuller is similar in some ways the extracts are somewhat longer. Uh, there are 12 of them, and this was originally designed as a course. I did this as, I had taught Fuller a number of times. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the way Fuller has kind of intertwined with my own personal life over the next, uh, oh, for the last 35 years. But uh, this was an online course I did about two years ago, and then it developed into this book. And what I've got here, it's kind of a self-study course because I have uh, a selection and then I have study questions. The other book that ba is back there that uh, pertains to Fuller is this one called Iron Sharpens Iron. Um, I'm not going to get into this in detail, but one of the things that deeply attracted me to study Andrew Fuller was the fact that he had the ability to develop and attract and sustain long-lasting friendships. And this book is a book on friendship. It obviously picks up the uh, passage from the book of Proverbs, iron sharpens iron, uh, so one friend sh uh, sharpens another. And uh, basically, this is a study of the friendships of Andrew Fuller and a man named John Ryland. 
And again, uh, if I had uh, a couple of hours this morning, uh, which I don't have, uh, I would, I'd, I'd spend maybe an hour looking at Fuller as a friend. And uh, one of the things that I think we desperately need in our world today as Christians are friends. I'm not talking about Facebook friends, uh, all these supposed friends you've got online, uh, but I'm talking about genuine friendships which take time. That's part of the reason why we don't have them, is because they take time. Uh, take time to nurture, to sustain them, um, and for a number of reasons in the 20th century, uh, especially men, um, don't have friends. My father-in-law, who went to be with the Lord about uh, two years ago, I knew him, for, I met him when he would have been uh, in his 50s. Um, between his 50s and his, his 90s when he died, um, he never went out with one friend. He had no friends, male friends. And uh, it was sad. Um, he was somewhat self-sufficient, and I suspect uh, he, was a, he was a hardy Scot, um, Scottish in uh, origins and very much in character, but... Um, I saw in him reflected, especially his generation, a man who had no, they, they just didn't have friends. They might have acquaintances they, they might talk with, but he, had, he didn't have friends. I never knew him to go out with a friend for a cup of tea. And uh, there's, there's something, I think, very sad about that. And um, anyway, I get that. A friendship has been a big thing for me all of my life, and um, this book grew out of a personal wrestling with friendship, this whole area. Uh, the way we do church, we come on Sundays, we're faithful, Monday, uh, Sunday morning, maybe evening, maybe a midweek meeting, but most of the friends there, quote unquote, they're not really friends. We, my wife and I were members of a church for 20 years, about 15 years in, my wife said to me, I don't really have any friends in this church. And when I mentioned that to the leadership, they said, we're a very friendly church. Uh, we left after about f five more years of that. Um, out of a congregation of 200, I had taught Sunday school for probably 20 years. Uh, two people can talk to us. Two of, the, uh, two of the elders, and rightly so, why are we decided to leave? It, and um, uh, people who I had chatted with every week, prayed with, not a word. And um, maybe the elders communicated to the congregation why we had left. Uh, it wasn't a big, huge rupture. We, we had just grown beyond or grown differently. But I, I've often thought back on that quite a number of times. Here are people you worship with week in, week out, and you leave, and you don't hear a word from them. And you just wonder, is, is, this, is, this, is this what the Christian life is meant to be like? I, very early on, I'm, I'm on a rabbit trail before I even get going. Very early on in my Christian life, I read a book by the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And uh, Bonhoeffer is a tremendous theologian. He's not an evangelical. Um, I don't think uh, only uh, evangelicals are Christians. I think we can learn from other Christians who aren't evangelicals. And Bonhoeffer, uh, as far as I know, does, didn't believe in inerrancy, which I think is a hallmark of being an evangelical and I think is absolutely central to being a, a, a faithful uh, Christian. But I think you can be an a Christian without believing that. C.S. Lewis, uh, the patron saint of evangelicals, <laughs> I uh, wasn't uh, committed to inerrancy either. But uh, Bonhoeffer wrote a little book called Life Together. I still remember my family and I used to vacation in Port Elgin, and uh, I would get up very early in the morning to go down onto the beach. Uh, a, vac a vacation in uh, Lake Huron like that is very different from Muskoka. Uh, there's a little beach here, but beach is, beach is not a big part of a Muskoka uh, vacation, but I used to go down on the beach and, uh, very early in the morning, and I'd read, I'd read uh, Bonhoeffer's Life Together. It's a small book, but it's the sort of book you read a sentence, 
and you have to stop and think about it for an hour. It's absolutely jammed. And basically, it's about living the Christian life together. And to be honest, it spoiled me. Uh, he gave me a vision of the Christian life, which has only it's not always been realized in churches. And um, anyway, that's all off to the side. And Fuller, Fuller was a man who was able to sustain friendships. Uh, friendships even when he and his friends disagreed over significant issues. His closest friend, uh, John Ryland Jr., who I've already mentioned, who baptized William Carey, he and Fuller disagreed over the most, most uh, controversial issue of their day, which was, should you receive unbaptized believers, according to the Baptist view, to the Lord's table and into membership of your church? Fuller was closed communion. You had to be a baptized believer, as a believer, by immersion into the triune name to be a member of his church. And that also had to be the case to receive the table at his church. John Ryland Jr., <laughs> no. Anybody who was walking with the Lord could be received at the table and into membership. That was the most controversial issue. You pick any controversial issue today among Christians, uh, charismatic issues, uh, I'm going to step out of the limb here, women in ministry, um, or state church relations, as we've seen in the last uh, uh, two or three years. And you put two men on the opposite sides of those questions, and strong disagreements, and yet they maintain their friendship. Ryland would say, I never heard one unkind word from Fuller to me over about 40 years of our friendship. And uh, they had, they, they, their disagreement actually came to a head when William Carey on the mission field, I am off on a big rabbit trail, but it's, this is important. William Carey's on the mission field, and they decide, we're out here in the middle of India, millions of Hindus and Muslims and Zoroastrians and whatever, and there's like a few little Christians, Presbyterians, Anglicans in Calcutta, we're going we're gonna to have the, we're going to let everybody come to the Lord's table. And um, when they wrote back to Fuller, and a letter took six months to get to England, Fuller was very upset, and he wrote back to them. That took another six months. So these, this correspondence went on, went on for two or three years, and finally Carey said, uh, you're right. We're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're not going to allow Anglicans and Presbyterians to partake of the table at our church. Then Ryland was now upset. Ryland said, I went to him and spoke as strongly to any man I would in England about gospel issues without giving him the least offense. And he would later say, if I didn't get a letter from Andrew Fuller every two weeks, it was painful to him spiritually. That's the only way of communication, right? They don't have telegraph. They don't have telephones. They don't have internet. And it, to me, I, I, I sp I've spent about 25 years just looking at their friendship, and it is such a model. Um, one of the big issues in the Christian life, we now turn to uh, looking at Fuller in terms of what I want to talk about. That was one long rapid trail. Um, uh, I want to talk to, to, to about the issue of leadership and how uh, I want to pick, I begin with a, a, a quote, and the quote is from the current academic dean of Beeson Divinity School in Samford University in Alabama, uh, Douglas Sweeney. He taught for many years at um, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School which is in, so I think it's in some problems, financial problems. One of the things, this is another rabbit trail, but which I do want to talk about because we're talking about theology. Uh, one of the things that is, is, is absolutely vital to the church in our day is theological education. Uh, I, you know, I sometimes, I, I'm amazed at churches. Uh, they need pastors, they want pastors, but they're not going to pay to get them educated. And I'm thinking, like, do, well, do churches think pastors just grow on trees? Uh, you need to support, you, you as God's people, uh, maybe not you personally, but definitely in prayer, you need to support faithful theological education. 
Um, I'm not going to get myself into trouble by talking about what it's like here in Ontario. We have uh, four major theological schools in Ontario that are evangelical. And uh, I could spend another two hours talking about that. But um, <clears throat> uh, it is vital. It is vital to the health of the church. And theological education is going through a major crisis today. Gordon Conwell Seminary, which has been a bastion for the gospel in the Northeast, has recently had to sell its entire campus. Uh, they're in financial trouble and move into downtown Boston. Uh, if that seminary goes under, there will be no gospel seminary in that part of America. Uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School is in the same perspective. That's in uh, the uh, Chicago area. And again, it would be an absolute devastating loss to the gospel if that school went under. I'm, I'm, please know I'm not encouraging you to do is send money necessarily to those schools. You know, they have, the, they have Americans who can, but you need to think about supporting theological education here in Ontario, definitely with your prayers um, and financially. And churches, uh, I've been writing the history of, uh, and this, I'm going to maybe get myself into trouble here, uh, the history of our local church, uh, West Highland Baptist Church. And uh, I've had access to the minute books over the last 50 years. And God has done a great work at West Highland, in, if you know the church, uh, with Pastor John Mahaffey, who's a tremendous leader. Um, but it's been interesting looking at how much they've given to theological education back in the 70s and 80s. To, they gave to two schools, uh, London, um, London Baptist uh, College and Seminary and uh, Central Baptist Seminary, and both those merged become heritage. And to be honest, at times it was a pittance. And uh, I'm being critical here. And um, <clears throat> uh, Moody, Moody Bible Institute is in real serious trouble. Uh, not only financially, but also theologically. And uh, theological education in North America is at a crossroads. And there will be schools that we, you know, you know their names. Your pastors were trained to them, leaders were trained to them, and they won't exist in the next 10, 15 years for a variety of reasons. And uh, it, is, it is, where are you going to train leaders? Now, some churches say, hey, we'll just train them on site. So then that means your pastor has to be an expert in Greek, Hebrew, church history. Uh, you might think Michael Haken's an expert in church history. Well, I guess I am in some areas, but the more I get to know, the more I realize I just don't know. And uh, systematic theology, Bible. I mean, what man could do all that in a local church? Maybe if you've got a mega church like, um, you know, some of the mega churches in the United States, like First Baptist Dallas with 20,000 members. <laughs> okay, maybe that, they could do it, but most churches cannot. We need, we desperately need theological education. And um, a fuller, a fuller it epitomizes uh, how God can train a man. Uh, theologically, and the importance of such a person. And leadership, that's a big issue today. Uh, uh, it's interesting watching theological education over the last uh, probably uh, 25 years. Uh, nobody had courses in leadership 25 years ago. Now they're part of theological education. And uh, here's this quote from Doug Sweeney about leadership. History teaches that reformation in the church is usually led by people who understand the past and know how to chart a different course for the people of God moving forward. History teaches that reformation in the church is usually led by people who understand the past and know how to chart a different course for the people of God moving forward. If you look back at the history of the church, what you recognize is how important leadership is for the church. Uh, as a Baptist, I'm very interested in people in the pew, which is what we should be. Other denominations are more leader-centered, but be all that as it may, even with Baptists, even with, even with the brethren who really kind of rejected the whole idea initially of pastors and elders, if you look at the early brethren, men like... Um, uh, J.N. Darby and George Mueller and Trigel 
I mean, these remarkable leaders that gave that, well, becomes, a, they wouldn't have called themselves denomination in the early days, but they are, they've had an enormous influence, far outweighing their, their size. All of the leaders at the Reformation were university trained men in a day when 2% of people went to university. Now, these were men who knew the languages. They knew Greek and Hebrew and Latin. In fact, they could speak in Latin. Latin was a living language for these people. Uh, all of the Puritans, all of them, except for two major Puritan figures, Richard Baxter and John Bunyan, but the rest of the Puritans were all university-trained men too, again in the day when maybe 2% of people went to university. And leadership is vital for the church. I know there was a period in my life uh, coming out of the charismatic movement when I thought, you know, well, leaders, well, well, what's important are the people of God, of course, in that sense. But I, I, and I, I, I would go up and uh, uh, I was teaching in Quebec uh, every summer for a couple of weeks, and I stayed in the home of the president of Sembec, a man named um, Jacques Alexanian. And if you, any, any of you know Jacques, he's just a remarkable, absolutely remarkable leader. And I'd get two weeks of immersion <laughs> of his philosophy of leadership. And it was tremendous, and uh, I, I realized how important leaders are to the life of a church. And the Baptists that we've been looking at were in uh, decline. They are in declension. And what God does is He brings revival, but part of that revival is He raises up remarkable men and some women and steal. Uh, I wish I'd had time. I wish I had another whole week. Uh, I don't have another whole week, Doug. Don't, don't be afraid. <laughs> I, I'm not going to stay on and do my own little kind of lectures on, <laughs> in the afternoon. Um, I wish I had another week because I could have spent a, a, a day or two on Ann Dutton. Anybody here heard of Ann Dutton? Anybody? Angie. Uh, Dr. Haas. And nobody else. She was the most prolific Baptist author in, authoress, female author in the, in the 18th century. Wrote about 50 books. Quite a remarkable theological thinker. And um, just was, was a vehicle in revival. She was friends with Whitfield. Whitfield would say, when I went to visit her, it was, I, her conversation was weighty. Uh, she was in touch with probably all the key leaders of the revival. Uh, most of them loved her. A couple of didn't like her. <laughs> John Wesley didn't like her. <clears throat> uh, she criticized his book on perfection, Christian perfection, which I talked about yesterday in the uh, Q&A. Uh, he had a bit of correspondence with her. Finally, he got so exasperated with her. He said, I don't think you've got the Holy Spirit in you. And uh, it, anyway, it wouldn't have... I, I'm not sure how she responded to that, but that's another story. Leadership is vital, and uh, the revival that comes to the Baptists in the 18th century, God raises up rem a remarkable circle of leaders, men like John Ryland Jr. and William Carey and John Sutcliffe of Olney, we talked about him earlier in the week, and this man, Andrew Fuller. Fuller... Um, was described, and at this point now, I'm going to transition to looking at his life. Fuller was described by Charles Spurgeon. You all know that name. I hope you do. He said, he said to Spurgeon once said, and he actually wrote it in a letter to Fuller's last surviving child, Andrew Gunton Fuller, in 1880. This is now 65 years after Fuller died. Fuller died a few days after the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. And um, nothing to do with the battle, but just to, if, all, if some of you were history guys, you, oh yeah, the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> Maybe you don't know where that was. And uh, that was a very, very important battle. It, it gave the British Empire hegemony, domination over the world for a hundred years because their long fight with the French which had gone on every decade. The English and British had fought the French every decade from the 1690s. 
There was a war every decade between the 1690 and 1815, 125 years of ongoing war for the domination of basically the globe. And uh, England ends up winning that war. And uh, anyway, that's another story. And Napoleon Bonaparte's defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. And a few days, the, 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 the crowds were absolutely jubilant. 25 years of war, 22 years to be exact. England had fought France, first with the French Revolutionary Wars, then the Napoleonic Wars. And no wonder the English people were absolutely celebrating in the streets and Fuller's dying in his house next to the church. And um, uh, 65 years later, uh, Andrew Gunton Fuller wrote a, wrote a book of his father, a biography of his father, and uh, sent a copy to Spurgeon. And Spurgeon said to him in a letter, I, re I have regarded your father as the greatest theologian of this century. And it uh, wouldn't, take wouldn't, take, wouldn't take too long for me to show that uh, C.H. Spurgeon was a Fullerite in his way of preaching and doing theology. Fuller, born 1754. He's born in a little village called Wiccan, W-I-C-K-E-N, nothing to do with Wicca. Right? That's a completely different thing, W-I-C-C-A. Wiccan. It's in East Anglia. It's in the part of England uh, that is flat as a pancake, like uh, the Netherlands, for example. And uh, it's an area called the Fens, a very marshy, boggy area of Norfolk, Suffolk, East Cambridgeshire, and Wiccan is in East Cambridgeshire. Um, it's an area of England where the winds come off the, the North Sea and um, uh, will drench that area frequently in rain. And it's the area where the, most of the leading Puritans who come to America initially come from. Men of independence, men who think for themselves. And Fuller's born into that. He's, his, his mother and father were uh, farmers, but not even wealthy enough to own a farm. They rented dairy farms. And when Fuller was seven years old, his parents moved from Wiccan, a little hamlet, uh, into Soham. S-O-H-A-M. I don't expect any of you to know where Soham is. I've been there a number of times. Um, nobody in England hardly knows where Soham is. It's a little market town. Um, the, one of the times I went to Soham, it was the uh, anniversary of, uh, 250th anniversary of Fuller's birth, 2004. And they wanted me, the church wanted me to give a lecture on Fuller. It was a really difficult lecture because about two weeks before that, uh, two little girls had been murdered in the town by the janitor of their school. And um, <clears throat> it, it just absolutely shook the town. It was a horrifying event. And uh, it was not an easy thing to talk about some historical event when everybody's thinking about this. The police had gone door to door. Most of the people in the church had had their houses searched, not because they suspected them, but because the police had initially had no clues and, and so on. Uh, it's a market town, about 3,000 people, uh, three churches in the town. Uh, the Baptist church where Soham moves, his pastor is named John Eve, E-V-E. -E. Uh, the Anglican church, and then the Congregationalist church, uh, the pastor of whom his first name was Adam, right? Adam and Eve. And people used to call the place paradise. Uh, it wasn't paradise for Fuller. Um, he grew up in a, his parents were believers. He grew up in a Baptist home. They took him to church every week. Uh, church was a cow barn. Six days of the week, they had cows in it. Saturday night, somebody mucked it out, put in benches, and that's where they worshipped. So you can imagine the odors in that barn. Not surprisingly, only about 40 people in the town went there. Uh, they didn't have the best of reputations, uh, partly because they also baptized believers in water, immersing them in water, sometimes in the winter. And people still thought getting baptized, getting plunged into water where your whole body is underwater was absolutely bizarre. Um, up until the early 1700s, it was, it was never recommended that you have a bath. Well, when, do when one doctor around 1690 said, I think it's a good idea that maybe on a regular, regular um, uh, you know, part of your regular regimen, you have a bath. 
but there's no showers, right? right? No, no showers. And people, people just laughed at him. Because everybody knew, when you put the body into water, the pores open, and that's just the recipe for disease getting in. Uh, when uh, Martin Luther got married to Katharina von Bora, somebody after, after about a year said, so what's it like to be married? You know, you've been a monk for 40 years, and now you've married a nun. What's it like? Well, he said, before I got married, I used to have maybe a bath once a year. <laughs> Katerina said, that will not do. <laughs> that's, that's the 1500s. Okay, they're just coming out of the Middle Ages. We can kind of deal with that. This is like 200 years on. And people still have these ideas about bathing is not good for you. And so these stupid Baptists are endangering your health, plunging you underwater. Anyway, so very few people came to the church John Eve was a hyper-Calvinist, classic hyper-Calvinist. That is, he did not believe that God would, would have the minister offer the gospel freely to all and sundry. If you could figure out who the elect were, <laughs> good luck, <laughs> before their conversion. Well, you could offer the gospel to them because God intended to save them. But... Offering the gospel to somebody who was not elect is like putting a carrot in front of a horse or a donkey. I think it's the donkey, right? That you want to do something, go a certain direction, and you got no intention of giving the, 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 the carrot to the donkey until it gets to the end. And I guess even there, the, carrot, the donkey gets the carrot, but God's got no intention of saving the non-elect. Don't preach the gospel to them in terms of urging them to come to Christ. They, number one, they can't come to Jesus. They're dead in sin. Number two, the Holy Spirit's not going to work on them. So why waste your breath? We actually have examples of when Fuller would be in a church and he'd be urging the lost one time uh, to come to Christ and one time a man comes up to afterwards and he says, what has he been doing all, all throughout that sermon? It's all a waste of time. When the Spirit wants to save him, he'll save him. You can't do it. And uh, not surprisingly, Fuller grew up in this church. He basically turned the guy off. I'm not converted, he do. So, he's got nothing to say to me. But in the meantime, he's wrestling. He's, he's reading Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and he's reading a Scottish uh, theologian named Ralph Erskine. He's reading his hymnody. And when he's 14, he's out plowing in the fields. He's a farmer. He left school when he was 12. Very typical that day. And suddenly, Romans 6, verse 14 comes to him in his mind. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are under grace. Now, in hyper-Calvinist thinking, if you're walking down a road or busy in, in your house, and suddenly a Bible verse comes to you out of the blue, that was a sign God was speaking to you. It's kind of charismatic. Oh, these, these Calvinists aren't charismatic, but it's kind of charismatic. And Fuller thought, God's telling me I'm among the elect. In fact, God's telling me I'm saved. Completely wrong thinking. And he, he, he said, that day I wept copious tears. God has saved me. I am not under the dominion of sin. But he said, then for six months after, I never read the Bible. I never prayed. I had no love for God's people. But six months later, he has a similar event. He says, this time he wept so much, his, his, his face was swollen. But then he, as he began, to think, like, okay, so I, I, I'm saved. I'm not, God's telling me, Romans 16, 14, I'm, I'm saved. But I, I didn't pray or anything like that. What, 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 must, what condition must I have been in? Ah, I must have been backslidden. For six months. I think if, 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 you'd be, if you'd given an altar call and Andrew Fuller had come forward weeping and all that, you, you would have, yeah, he's saved. He wasn't saved. He, just, he had had a profound religious experience, but he was not converted. And again, for another whole year, he lived basically in sin. He had this experience, and I'm sure all of you may know people who've had experiences with, with God, authentic, genuine, 
but the depths of their hearts have not been broken up. They have never truly repented and believed on the Lord Jesus. And so it was a fuller. And about a year after that, this is now 1769, he's 15 years old. He begins, he's out in the field, he's got plenty of time to think. He begins to realize, I have abused the grace of God. I've assumed I'm converted. I'm not converted. I don't pray. I don't love going to church. I don't read the Bible. I'm not a Christian. I'm going to go to hell. And his whole, his, he's actually in the middle of going through a genuine conversion, but he's got this hyper-Calvinist thinking, another part of which is the only way you can go to Jesus is you have to figure out if you're among the elect. Again, good luck on that one. <laughs> I mean, you got to figure out, okay, am I among the elect? Is, is God elected me from eternity past? If he has, then I can flee to Jesus and ask him to save me. It's backwards, right? I believe, I believe in election. But that's not the way the scripture lays it out. And so Fuller's, Fuller, no, I'm not elect, but I don't want to go to hell. And so he said, there came to my mind that story of Esther. Remember Esther? When she went into the presence of King Ahasuerus at the danger of her life. And though, if he slay me, he slay me. I have no other course of action I must do. And he said, I fled to Christ as my Savior. And God saved him. He was baptized uh, the following April, April 1770. Baptized in a little river. You can still see it in Psalm. Uh, the first time I ever went to Psalm, I wanted to find the river that he was baptized in, and it was flowing there. There's a little bridge over it. This is a beautiful little, little town in many ways. And uh, I wanted to get a picture of it, so I had to go onto per- somebody's private property. So I'm on this, there's a bridge here, and then I'm here, you need to be careful, I'm here on the person's private property taking this picture, and suddenly uh, I hear this voice, uh, the woman who owned the house I was standing on her grass sticks her head out, what are you up to? Well, I'm, I'm taking a picture of the river, right? I'm, yeah, this, is, this is where Andrew Fuller was baptized. Who on earth is he? <laughs> this, is, you know, this is like 1992 or something like this. And I don't know if anybody in, in uh, so I'm remembered Fuller, but be that as it may, I told her, and oh, oh, she was thrilled. You know, some important guy was plunged under water here. So about a year later, I was doing a, I would, one of the things I would do with my doctoral students is I take a couple of them over to Britain. I'm a big believer, if you're going to do history, you've got to go to the places where things happened. So um, uh, I wanted to show them you know, where Fuller was baptized. So we get, we get, it might be two or three years later, we get to the, we get to the bridge and the river and the woman's put a fence up. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't get onto her property. But it gets funnier. So I'm, we're on the bridge, and I'm talking about this. And you know when people are looking at something, other people going by, what are you looking at? So we're on the bridge, and on the other side of the bridge, you got the woman's house on this side, the bridge, and then there's a pub <laughs> on the other side. So myself and like two, other, two of my students are looking at the water, and we're talking about Andrew Fuller. A couple of people come by. They're going to the pub. They stop, and they're looking in the water. <laughs> And finally, one of them says, like, like, what are we looking at? <laughs> and I tell them, oh, they were not that impressed about that either. <laughs> and um, so Fuller joins the church. And uh, within five years, they've called him to be the pastor. Uh, now he's got to preach. John Eve had left. All he's ever heard is John Eve's preaching. So how does he, how does he preach? Well, He starts to preach like John Eve, not offering the gospel freely, not urging the lost. He said, I knew it was wrong, but I had no other model. And so he goes back to Scripture and he begins to read, how did Jesus preach? How did the apostles preach? And maybe you've never thought about how did Jesus preach, but if you go through the gospels, particularly the gospel of John, Jesus confronts all kinds of people. Jesus never tried, Jesus in his humanity doesn't know how to figure out, okay, is that guy elect? Is that guy non elect? He offers the gospel to the wicked freely, indiscriminately, urging them, I am the light of the world. Come to that light. And so on. 
And Fuller begins to write a book. Uh, it's called The Gospel Worthy of All Acceptation, a uh, phrase drawn from uh, uh, 1 Timothy. And uh, by 1778, he's written the first draft. Uh, not happy with it, he goes back and rewrites it. And he's finished it by 1782. And the book is about the obligations of sinners to believe on the Lord Jesus. That when you hear the gospel, it is your duty to believe on the Lord Jesus. It's not your duty to figure out, okay, am I among the elect? Uh, it's not your duty to figure out, okay, is the Holy Spirit working in my life? You are to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a command. If you're here this day and you're not a Christian, this is God's command to you. The first thing he's commanding you is you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ without delay. There is no other way of salvation. On the other hand, it's a gift. The hyper-Calvinists were right in that sense. Only God can save sinners. But that does not relieve you of your responsibility. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility. There's a tension, and you got to have both of them. And Fuller's book, The Gospel Worthy of All Acceptation, lays this out. He finishes it in 1782 and um, waits three years to publish it. Finally publishes it in 1785. By that point, he's moved to another church in Kettering. The church in Soham uh, couldn't afford to pay him. Uh, people were not joining the church. And it took him a year. He was invited to go to Kettering. Kettering is a much larger, a bit of a larger town. Um, it's in Northamptonshire in the Midlands of England. And um, it would become a major industrial center for shoemaking. Uh, that was in its early stages when Fuller went there. And Fuller took a year to figure out, should I leave these dear people in Soham? As John Ryland said, he said, generals in battle decide quicker what to do than Fuller did about leaving this little church of 40 people. But he loved these men and women. He was their pastor. And finally, he does decide to go in, in Kettering, and that's where he'll be from 1782 till his death in 1815. By the time he gets to Kettering, he's finished this book, and he's committed now to preaching the gospel freely and indiscriminately. And God blesses that ministry. The the church that he goes to has got about 100 to about 150, well, not even that many in the, in, when he gets there. By the end of his ministry, there's 1,000, literally 1,000 regularly on Sunday mornings and evenings. Um, he, uh, they start services in midweek for young people. Hundreds are converted under his ministry. God blesses it with the revival. I've been there a number of times. The last time I was there... It was probably one of the worst sermons I've ever heard in my life. The church is Dow. It can seat a thousand. It's probably got 40 people. And the person who preached that day, I was just squirming. I felt like jumping up at one or two points and yelling, you're wrong. But they had been very kind to me. They have a little kind of archives there and a little fuller room. And they love Fuller. They love his memory. It's sad. Uh, they got a sta beautiful stained glass of Fuller at the back of the church, which I've used on a number of occasions as a photograph or picture, but they don't know the gospel. At least it, that man who preached that day didn't know the gospel. He was, uh, anyway, that's, an, that's another story too. And um, <clears throat> Fuller, Fuller hesitates for about three years to, to, send, to, send, to take that book. He, he actually will walk from Kettering to Northampton about 10 miles away. That's where his close friend John Ryland Jr. was the minister. And he, his book was published by a man named Thomas Dicey. And Thomas Dicey printed all kinds of stuff. He, one, of the, one of the blessings of God that only in the last probably 15, 20 years have I thought about are printers and publishers. I talked about theological education. Printers and publishers are absolutely vital to the gospel. Right? You think about Middle Ages... John Wycliffe tries to start a reformation. Everybody's copying stuff by hand. <laughs> Roman Catholic Church shuts, shuts it down pretty quickly because they arrest uh, those of his disciples who are copying out Wycliffe's books in the Bible. Mm, only maybe 30, 40 of them. You arrest 20 of them, you can shut it down. 
Once, one of the, one of the, once the printing press is invented, you cannot easily shut it down. In the, in the book of Revelation, there's an angel that goes around the world preaching the gospel. It's a very odd uh, little passage. Martin Luther says, I know exactly what that angel is. It's the printing press. <laughs> Luther's, Luther's a great figure in church history. He's got such interesting views, and nobody else believes that Luther was right on that one. But the printing press, printers... All kinds of printer. You probably know one printer, Johann Gutenberg, right? The man who invented the printing press. Uh, one of the highlights of a trip my wife and I did to, to Europe was to go out to go to Mainz in Germany. And we went to Gutenberg's uh, print shop, and it was absolutely fabulous. Um, printers, they're, they're absolutely vital. And Thomas Dicey, Thomas Dicey had started his career printing uh, playing cards and ephemeral literature and posters. And then somehow, and I, we don't know enough about him to know whether he was converted, he started printing Christian books, and one of them is the gospel worthy. Uh, Fuller was uh, hesitant to print it because he knew it would plunge him into controversy, and it sure did for the rest of his life. Hyper-Calvinist in London attacked him. Uh, Fuller was about six foot tall, really stocky build, Remember I, early in the week I mentioned when he, before he was um, converted, he was a wrestler. He loved wrestling. Not a professional wrestler, <laughs> but uh, just loved wrestling. And, and uh, remember I mentioned the story, you know, when he was preaching sometimes, he'd look down and he'd see a you know, stocky, well-built man. He, and he'd think, I wonder if I could throw that guy and pin him. And that's, he actually admits that. He says, yeah, that sometimes went through my mind when I was preaching. And... Um, <clears throat> Fuller, Fuller was, um, he, you, need to be, uh, uh, you need to have that sort of resilience to be a defender of the Christian faith publicly. And Fuller had it. That, that, he, that didn't bother him because he would go on, he'd, he'd, he'd write major apologies against two of the major heresies of that day. Deism, there is a God. We've all got immortal souls. You do enough good, you'll get into heaven. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was a deist. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. Uh, if you are an American and uh, you have the idea that all of the founding fathers were Christians, uh, sorry, uh, that's, a big, that's a big debate among historians, but I'd lean definitely. I've, I've read Thomas Jefferson. There's no way the man was a Christian. Um, he went through the Bible on one occasion and he crossed out every word that's every sentence that said Jesus was God or referred to the Trinity. He actually scored it right out. It's called the Jefferson Bible. Um, <clears throat> so Fuller wrote a, a, a response to deism, uh, particularly against a man named Tom Paine, who was a, he was a British uh, individual, fled to America, anti-monarchist, joined the revolution. His little book, 75 pages, Common Sense, was absolutely incendiary to the American Revolution, and, but he was an ardent deist. And the other heresy that Fuller wrote against was Unitarianism. It was a very fast-growing heresy in that day, and Fuller, Fuller, Fuller realized from his, respond, his book on hyper-Calvinism, God had gifted him as an apologist. And we thank God for people like um, uh, C.S. Lewis in our day, or other apologists like Alistair uh, McGrath, uh, etc., who can defend the faith publicly. Os Guinness, uh, Francis Schaeffer, uh, these men whom God has raised up to publicly defend the gospel in the, in the public square. So Fuller, Fuller wasn't upset about that, but what Fuller was upset about was the petty sniping that often goes along with controversy. So about 12 miles away from Kettering, there's a little town called Rushton. There was a woman, a widow, a widow uh, named Mrs. Wright, and I know all of this because um, in 1992, um, I spent uh, a whole day, well, actually a couple of days, going through the minute books of uh, Fuller's church, uh, which normally people don't get to look, look at. Uh, it's a one of a kind, and I still remember <clears throat> it was, uh, let me kind of give you the picture, um, 1992 was the bicentennial of the celebration of the formation of the Baptist Missionary Society. And um, 
there were all kinds of celebrations going on, and Fuller was, he was the first secretary. There were all celebrations in his church, and um, a tour of Americans was coming through that day. I'm in, I'm in the, kind of like the vestry, uh, with the, the minute book, and I hear all these American voices outside. And I, my wife and I had been in, in England at that point for about six weeks, and I was really homesick. And I'm a Canadian. And I hear these American voices, and man, it just, oh, they were Texans, actually. <laughs> and uh, Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary always used to lead a tour of England every year. And this was a really big one. They had about 70 of them. And uh, the secretary of the church, I actually never saw any of them that day. I stayed in the vestry. I had a lot of work to do. And the secretary of the church came in and said, we're putting on this, um, on this um, <clears throat> lunch for all these people. Would you, would you like lunch? I said, well, I got a lot of work to do. Well, I, I'll bring the lunch here. Oh, okay. So this is an absolutely invaluable document, only one of its kind. And it's there, and the woman, very quintessential British, comes in, pot of tea and uh, biscuits and sandwiches, and plunks it right down beside the book. Like it's an absolute nightmare. I mean, <laughs> this is, <laughs> you don't do this. Of course, it was easy. It was great for me, but it's an absolute nightmare from an archivist's point of view. And um, I have lunch, and I say to the woman, I said, um, well, what will I do with the, the minute book? I'll just leave it there when you're finished. I'm, I'm going to get to Mrs. Wright in a minute, and so bear with the rabbit trail. And um, <clears throat> so I left the book right there, and then about eight years later, I was in the major uh, library of Baptist literature in England. It's at Regent's Park College in Oxford. And the archivist said to me, uh, Dr. Hagen, you use that minute book of Fuller's Church, right? She knew I had because I had written, I had written something in which I quoted it a number of times. I said, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was 1992. I said, yeah. Well, she said, it's gone missing. Like, nobody's seen it since you <laughs> used it. <laughs> See, the English, I grew up there. She didn't come out and say, did you steal it? I mean, but that's what she was kind of hinting at. And I said, I'm, I, I said, I left it right. I told her the whole story. I left it there. Oh, okay. I was, I was really upset. I mean, I don't, I don't remember if I wrote to the church, but for the next three or four years, I'm thinking, people in England, at least in those circles, think I stole the minute book. Like, this is a one of a kind. These books will never be, you know, people talk about, you're, you're gonna, eventually we're going to get everything on the internet. Well, no, we're not. Because somebody's going to have to go through that page by page. And how many people in the world are interested in Andrew Fuller? I mean, it's just never got to get published on the internet. And these are one-of-a-kind books. But uh, a few years later, 2004, uh, a biography of Andrew Fuller came out by Peter Morden. Peter Morden was the vice principal of Spurgeon's College when he wrote it. He's now the pastor of a uh, Baptist church, a flourishing Baptist church in Leeds in Northern England. And we met, we met in St. Pancras Station, if you know where that is in England. It's right next door to King's Cross, right? Harry Potter, that's where Harry Potter took off at platform nine and three quarters or wherever there. And Pan St. Pancras used to be, it was a derelict station and they've redone it. It's got fabulous stores. And so we met at a cafe because he, he, was, he had written this biography fuller and I wanted to chat with him. And I had read in the biography, this is now 2004, so my experience of being told I had snitched the book was about three years before this. I had noticed he had cited the book. So I said to him, you, you cited the minute book, didn't you? He said, oh yeah. He said, let me tell you the story of trying to find it. He said, I went to the church and I asked, like, I'd like to look at the minute book. Well, oh yeah, it's in such, such a place. Hey, wait, it wasn't there. He said, I spent a whole day searching the church. Finally, I found it stuck in a broom closet. So whoever had picked it up, they just stuck it up in a broom closet, and basically it was effectively lost for three years. Uh, I've got all kinds of stories about Baptists and their minute books, and it's not good. Uh, Baptists don't keep their records well. And oh, I was so relieved. Uh, Historians in England know that Michael Aiken didn't snitch the minute book. In the minute book, around um, 1786, the minutes record, Mrs. Wright from Rushton came to the church 
and asked to, be, to transfer her membership. And we told her she needed a letter of dismission, D-I-S-M-I-S-S-I-O-N. That's a technical word. It means dismissal. But when you leave a church, you need to get a letter from your church, not just Baptist, to say you're a member in good standing. So when you go to another church, I'm a big believer in this. When you go to another church, they've got a, they've got a record that you've walked according to the gospel. And so we told her, you need to get a letter from the pastor at Rushton Baptist Church. Fine. She goes to him. He's a hyper-Calvinist. And she asked him for the letter. This is all in the minute books. She, uh, Mrs. Wright asked for the letter, but the pastor, a man named Noel, said, I am not giving you a letter. Andrew Fuller has a betrayed the gospel. Well, she asked him a second time, and then... He refused to give the letter. Andrew Fuller wrote to the man. This is all in the minute book. And the man wrote back and he said, Number one, you've betrayed the gospel. I'm not giving that woman a letter to go to your place. I think you're an Arminian. Number two, who are you to tell us to give the woman a letter? You've got no authority over us. We're not giving the Mrs. Wright a letter. This went on for seven years. Finally, the church... About two or three years in, the, the Fuller said, the elders say to the woman, you've been here now for two or three years. You don't need the letter. We know you. It, it's odd, but we'll, we'll accept you on the basis of your testimony. She says, no, I want the letter. <laughs> <laughs> and Knowles had to die. And the next pastor had come along, he gave her the letter about seven or eight years later. And that's what Fuller was disturbed about, the, the, the pettiness that sometimes Christians engage in. He wasn't afraid of theologian, pastor theologians writing against him, but the pettiness. All of this led eventually to Fuller becoming part of the Baptist Missionary Society. If it is the case that it is the duty of sinners to respond to the gospel, it is the obligation of preachers to urge the lost to respond. And if you do not, their blood is on your hands. Remember, Fuller is a Calvinist. But he's simply spelling out what he says in Ezekiel. And it is also, therefore, the case that if you as a church are not engaged in evangelism and mission, you are also disobeying the gospel. And so it's not surprising that Fuller and Carey got together and in a in Oct in Octo on October the 2nd, it's a wintry day, we know that, because in the diary of uh, William Cooper, about 10 miles away, 15 miles away from Kettering, Cooper notes in his diary, blustery day, stormy thunderstorms. In that evening, 12 men crammed into a little parlor of a widow named Wallace. Her husband had been, B.B. Wallace had been an elder at the Church of Kettering. And they founded the Baptist Missionary Society. None of these men had any money. They all put in a few pennies. Probably would amount to about four or five hundred dollars today. <laughs> you tried founding a missionary society with five hundred bucks. And uh, that was the first missionary society in the English speaking world to, to plan and engage in cross cultural missions. And within a year, Kerry has been sent to India. And Fuller is the secretary, and he will spend his life preaching at the gospel, writing these books, and the third part, defending the mission of that society, writing letters to the missionaries. They send out missionaries to India initially, and then uh, Southeast Asia, the Caribbean. The Baptists in the Caribbean are absolutely essential to the fight against the slave trade. They are horrified when they get to places like Jamaica, and they see what Englishmen are doing to Africans, and they become vital in fighting the slave trade there and slavery. Uh, East Africa, West Africa, and he, he has to copy by hand all these letters. He'd be up into the wee hours of the morning writing letters to all these missionaries. Uh, there's no duplicating machines, right? No typewriters. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, if you ever go to Jefferson's home in Monticello, Jefferson was really, he's a was a brilliant man despite his era, uh, religious errors. 
He invented a machine where he could write, and this machine had a pen over here, and whatever he wrote was duplicated. It's, I, it's got a technical name. It's some sort of writing machine. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, Fuller didn't have that. And then there were trips, and Fuller had, sometimes Fuller would be away from home two months. Um, he couldn't afford the money to sit inside the coach, right? They're going by coach. Uh, this, is the day, this is the days before the macadamized roads, right? You know what macadamization has done? The blacktop gives you a smooth ride, uh, potholes, coaches without... I mean, I, I watch a lot of Jane Austen, you know, and those sort of movies, and it looks so beautiful, you know, going along in these coaches, the English countryside, little sheep up on the hill. But man, those coaches did, their springs were really bad, and they're hitting potholes. They don't show you that in the movies, because they're, right? Because they're traveling on our macadamized roads, not the 18th century roads. And, and that was the way you traveled. And um, <clears throat> uh, there were two, two price fairs inside the coach and outside the coach. And Fuller never had enough money. He didn't want to spend money and waste money. He was very frugal. He would sit outside the coach. That means you were exposed to all the weathers. Like the time he crosses the Pennines, the Pennines is the mountain range in, between Yorkshire and Lancashire in northern England. It's in July, and they hit a snowstorm. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's how high it is. And uh, Fuller's on the outside. He's soaked to the, soaked to the skin. And what's he doing? He's going around churches, raising money. Uh, the best, very interesting, the best people he loved going to were the Scots. Scottish Presbyterians stood behind him and the mission completely. Largest crowds he ever speak, preached to were places like Edinburgh, where he, could, he preached to two or 3,000 people. It, it, he, he was used to preaching to maybe 150 in his early years. Later, it got bigger. But just remarkable ministry. When he died in 1815, six months later, uh, William Carey got news of his friend's death. And Carey wrote a letter back, but the first words of the letter were, I loved him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the witness of such men who by your grace did great things in their day for your glory and your kingdom. Oh, that you would raise up leaders in our day, men and women who love the gospel and who expect great things from you, our God, and attempt great things. Bless uh, this day and be with us, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.